What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Uh, today is a good one. Today is going to be maybe a hard one for us because I we don't have the answer to this one. It's all about raising good humans. So, Which is maybe my worst fear in life. Is to raise a good human. Is to fail at that. <laughs> we have no idea how to raise a good human. We're only... We're only three years into raising a human at all. I know. And we're just struggling through it. So if you have ideas, feel free to share them in the comments on the discussion board at community.familymade.com. And if you like this show as a whole, please subscribe to it. Give it a rating on whatever platform you're listening on. We do video. We do audio. We do. That's it, actually. We do. That's all things. we do. We do those yes. two things. Yes. Okay. So we are parents and the goal is. Of parenting, in my mind, mm -hmm. is to raise responsible, contributing human beings. What defines a good human? Just that? Here's what I'm saying. I actually don't like the title because, yeah. I love What it. does it even mean to be a good human? I think it's exactly. <sighs> exactly. No, wait. I have, the, I have the thought. It's exactly what you... The opposite of raising a good human is not what anybody wants. I don't want to raise a murderer. I don't want to raise someone who's unkind, that cheats, steals, lies, does bad things. So whatever good means, it's just not that. I just feel like so many people have so many different standards on good that it's really ambiguous. Okay? I, I want them to be kind, caring, compassionate responsible, respectful human being. Here's the thing. I think every parent wants to do this, which is raise a good human. The challenge is defining what that actually means for you and for your family. And uh, Sean and I are probably in the process of doing that. You'll you'll see and, and hear in this episode that we actually don't have it ironed out <laughs> as much as we should, which is a homework assignment for us. But uh, I feel like after having kids ourselves, we realize that actually going about raising someone who uh you know is responsible and contributing is is harder than it looks and so uh, i mean our kids kind of mimic us right mm -hmm. so they'll pick up our good traits but it, they'll also pick up our bad traits which is like hey i got a short fuse or i'm lazy or whatever it is right i think kids <laughs> okay to all the parents out there i think kids are like the most unforgiving mirrors you've ever like had in your entire life yes because understandably so kids can be so frustrating and so like you can get so tired and you can just like be at the end of your rope basically <laughs> so easily and little kids drew for the first or for example the other day she stopped me dead in my track she said mommy you're being mean and i was like wow <laughs> The term good is in need of being specified, right? And whether you're spiritual, religious, or whether you are in part uh, some community, like different groups will, will define good in different ways. So you just now kind of riffed off like, hey, I don't want my kid to cheat, to lie, to do bad things, right? Yes. You could say, hey, I want my kid to you know, loosely follow the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to explain the fact that you need, as a family, to define what good means. But... I want to go back then on what I said. Wait, what? Because, like, this is where it gets so crazy as parents. Because now in my mind, I'm like, well, they can make mistakes. That doesn't make them a bad human. Let's hit some high level things okay. of what we're trying to accomplish as parents. First and foremost, we at the end of the day want to show our kids unconditional love, right? Yes. I feel like we have read so many books, been told by so many psychiatrists, psychologists, pediatricians, doctors, everybody that when it comes down to it, the greatest thing you can ever give a child is unconditional love. Every single day, just reiterating, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter who you are, I will always, always love you. This this term unconditional love has actually uh, come into 
focus for me or I feel like over the past week, um, we were talking to one of our friends who recently gave birth and they were like, you know, I just want to be proud of my wife because she gave a natural birth. Oh my gosh. It's like, that is, that's actually conditional. That is conditional. Right. Yes. Unconditional love. How powerful is that where it's like, you know, people ask us all the time, are your kids going to be athletes? It actually doesn't matter. No matter if they're athletes or not, we will love them. No matter the conditions of what they do, yeah, we will love them. Obviously, there's going to be a million more situations, but beyond just like, are they athletes or not? Maybe they're, maybe they decide to get, you know, tattoos. Are we going to love them? Absolutely. You have tattoos. That's a bad example. But you, you see, it could get pretty nuanced as far as like, I don't know. That's that's what's revealing about parenting is they're going to make decisions that we never would. And it's like, oh, is that a condition that I would stop loving them under? Like, what if, yes. you, what if they did drugs? I don't know. I'm just saying. Here's my thought. We've talked about this. And yeah. I, I think you and I are on the same page as this. When it came to the conversation of having children, we ran through the gamut of like, what if? What if? And there are, are a bajillion different what ifs that can happen. But at the end of the day, unconditionally loving your child, truly standing by the idea and concept of no matter who you are, no matter what you do, I don't have to agree with you, but I will always love you because I will always be your parent and you will always be my child. In some ways, unconditional love in marriage is easier than parenting because... Because if I don't agree with my child, I feel like it's my responsibility as a parent to correct them. Oh you know what I'm gosh. saying? You know what no. I'm saying? Yes. To a no. certain extent. No, I'm not saying like in, in style things like, hey, you wore baggy jeans, Jet. That's like I need to correct you. It's not the case I'm talking about. I agree. But I think as a parent, you have to draw such a hard line. And that that is so hard. Like it's very hard to find this line because it's very great. But you have to remember, you have to remember at the end of the day, it's easier potentially to unconditionally love your spouse than your child because your spouse you have accepted as a different person. Your child, a lot of people get caught up in trying to replicate themselves or a life that they didn't have in their child. They try to create a human being instead of acknowledging that like this child is already their own person. And I think a lot of kids... (laughs) get really messed up very early on in life because when parents think they're giving unconditional love, they're giving conditional love because they say, Ooh, you chose this sport. That's not, that's not your best sport. That's not your best thing. Or you dressed this certain way, or I feel like kids learn at such a young age that they have to earn your love if you aren't doing it potentially the right way. Well, I agree with you up until the point where it's like, there needs to be boundaries established. Right. So it's like, Hey, you cannot do this. Do you disagree with me here? I jet cannot jump in the pool as a one-year-old with no floaties. (laughs) I will set the boundary hard (laughs) on that. I'm not kidding. This is an example. I what agree to disagree. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I am shook. I I don't disagree with the you cannot, but what I don't think it ends there. I think <laughs> I'm so interested. Like with Drew, she's old enough now that I can have these conversations with her to a certain extent, where it's like, Drew, you cannot get into the pool without mommy or daddy watching you. Okay, and she'll be like, but why, mama? And I'm like, because it's not safe for you, and we want. To pr- like we want to keep you safe we don't want to lose you and like all of these things and yes that's a good example of like you have to have a, a line there of like we don't want you to die but if you run down the road even further on this so well, you have to draw lines it's like you cannot be a Lawyer, because we don't believe in it. We don't believe in law? I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm I'm just saying. Like, I feel like parents, you have to, every single decision, every single day, every single, like, thing you're trying to teach your kid, 
Are you trying to make them you? Or are you trying to let them be who they are? Hmm. And will you, like, yes. Yeah, because unconditional love kind of, uh, it kind of assumes acceptance. Yes. But I feel like a big part of unconditional love is setting limits and boundaries and expectations so that you provide a framework for them to grow and learn. But even if she's like, this is what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. This is what I believe in. There is nothing about that that makes me choose to not love her. Correct. But I can disagree. And I think, I think what happens a lot is people, parents forget that difference. Like we've talked about this. When Drew does something mean, we're like, Drew, that was a mean decision. That was a mean action. You are not mean. But that that action was mean. And so you can like go into okay. the depths of I disagree with your choice, <laughs> well, but I love you. Well, I still accept you. So you're saying we may not always love the choice, but we can always love them. Always. I think we could talk about that for the next 80 years of our life and how you break that down because that's super complicated. Like what if it's a pattern of like it is consistent choices and it's kind of like is that who they are? Oh, at some point, I don't know. What an interesting! I did not expect that to go down that road, but I'm glad. It, I'm glad we did. Okay, Me too. so we have some thinking to do on that one. But we want to show our kids unconditional love in our words, in our actions, in our time. Clearly, what that looks like from mom might look different from what that looks like from dad, which actually is probably a beautiful thing. What you're probably going to show unconditional love in a different way that I will. You did <laughs> All right, the rest of the episode is just about unconditional love. Why? I think that is very possible. How would, how, oh, that means your definition's <laughs> different. No. How do you show unconditional love no, that differently? Means, that means the idea. source, uh, the well of the love is different. It's like Dasani water tastes different than, than Ice Mountain. That well, doesn't mean it's different. It's not no, water. No. That's the question, though. You said you might show it differently. How do you show unconditional love differently than than unconditional love? I think about my grandpa was a disciplinarian. It didn't feel like he loved me. But now, as I'm older and setting my own boundaries for life and realizing, like, hey, this is a healthy choice and this isn't. This is a healthy uh, pattern or, like, path to go down and this isn't. My gosh. What what an incredibly brave act of unconditional love he bestowed on me by disciplining me. No, you're I think that you is unconditional love. He said, I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with your tears and your frustration and your backlash because I love you so much, I am going to push you to this point. We're we're not saying different things. Okay. At all. Okay. Our definition is identical. Okay. No matter what they do, what they say, or who they are, we will love them. So, like, your grandpa always loved you. Yes. It's not because of an action or choice that you did that he stood there and said, I don't love you anymore, or I don't love you right now because you chose to do this bad thing. Yeah. So you're saying the same exact thing. Okay, great. In showing unconditional love, I think there's only black or white. You can either choose to unconditionally love your child or you can choose to conditionally love them. How you show that is based off of your choice. Okay, when the baby's crying, because I, I, I think it is displayed differently. No, it's not. You, you show it in this affection. I. You know what I'm saying? I yeah, show but you're it getting in into like a this. nuance of how do I love my kid? Yeah, we're talking about unconditional love. Yes. We're Shh. speaking different languages, but we're saying the same exact thing. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's possible. I think the only question here is in your heart yes. and soul, do you still love your child based off of their decisions? All right, Lexi's excited for this, babe. She's excited for us to read this. And I am too, because today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Babe, did you know that headaches, teeth grinding, 
and digestive issues can be indicators of stress. What? Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, sure does. People, you need to listen to your bodies. I'm actually on this whole like self-discovery journey right now, and I'm meeting with a nutritionist, getting my allergies retested, and seeing a therapist each week, thanks to BetterHelp. Sean sent me a picture of all the allergy pricks that she had in yeah. the forum, and I was like, is this a new tattoo? What is happening? And it was a lot. Anyway, uh, I'm proud of you, babe, for your Thank self-discovery. You. And when Sean puts her mind to doing something, she invests all all of her energy into it <laughs> thanks babe i think that's a compliment um i've just been trying to get back into a healthy routine for both my mind and my body for our babies for you and the cool thing about better help is it's so much more affordable than in-person therapy that's right and you can chat with your online therapist over a phone call or zoom and it even has a chat option which has been great for both of us when we don't want to actually Verbally talk. <laughs> True. Uh, a couple things is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash eastfam. That's B E T T E R H E L P dot com slash eastfam. Take care of your mental health. Check it out. Link below. Let's get back to it. So, on the similar note of unconditional love, I feel like it's important to teach the kids that perfection is not the goal. So whether that means like in test scores or in sports or whatever, whatever you can gauge as being perfect or not perfect, it's not necessarily about like the end result as it is about who you're becoming, you know? I think this is, like you said, the same exact thing as unconditional love. It's if you teach your kids that they have to earn your love, perfection, success, all of that falls into the same bucket. It's like you have to earn it. You have to get a good test score. You have to achieve, you know, a medal or a placement in a sport. You have to truly work for it. And I think if you can reiterate to your children early on that it's not about earning, then it, it's unconditional. I feel like I feel like you have a real tangible experience with this that not many people do. I do. I mean, my parents were the epitome of unconditional love. They would talk to me every single night and say, you know, like gymnastics is not our thing. It's your thing. And if you wanted to quit today, then we would support you. We love you. But I will say in my sport, just being around other kids who felt that the opposite I had to kind of have that reminder constantly of that love is there no matter what. Perfection and perfectionism can be very hard for a kid to digest. In my sport, we didn't have anything called a perfect 10. And I'm more and more thankful for that as time goes on. I feel like it's such like a, if that's what always your focus is, then that carries over to like anything carries over to like how you gauge being a mom like is it am i being a perfect mom is it am i being a perfect wife we struggle with that you know it's like it's hard to break that mindset of performance because it's not always about like you're not always doing a scoreboard it's not yeah. always about keeping score it's really hard to turn that off i do think though <laughs> you have dealt with something very similar because in any sport, in any recreation, hobby, activity, you can measure success and what the next level is. And I, I remember you feeling pressured to, like, make it to the NFL and to play so many games and then to play so many years. And your friends and family were so excited to go to games. And it's like you still had that sense of earning their pride, which a lot of times people can confuse with love. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like when you have a performance mindset, it nixes and negates the opportunity to be open and honest about mistakes that you make, which therefore negates a learning opportunity. So anyway, it's not about, it's not about the end result as much as it is about the journey. That's cliche, but it is true. I do think one other little point here that we have written down, which is really important, is like accepting your imperfections and teaching your kid to like own them and that it's normal. So if you accidentally snap at your kid or if you snap at your spouse or you do something unkind or you feel like you did something wrong, you should 
tell your child, be like, I am so sorry. Like mommy is tired. And because of that, I was grumpy and that's not okay. And do you please forgive me? It should, it should be, if you can own your imperfections and your mistakes in front of your child and teach them that, I think that sets them up for success. So I've read. <laughs> you're really Again. good. You're really good at that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause at some point in life you mature enough to realize that it's not about being perfect. And then you have the self-awareness of what you're not, per- well, you're not perfect at anything, but you have the self-awareness of, Hey, I'm not perfect at this when I'm good at it. Or, you know, this is something I really need to work on. And on the other hand, right. They're just like self-awareness is a really good thing. Moving on. We have written down that <clears throat> we as parents need to be happy and confident but before we can teach our kids to be this way. Parents hugely influence um, their children and who they are and how they act. Whether it's how you talk to yourself, how you portray yourself, how you um, walk around from day to day, all of that is something that your kid is watching and learning from and taking in. And how you treat yourself is how your kid will learn to treat themselves. And I think that's really terrifying because it puts a lot of pressure on parents. But um, it actually says, according to psychologists, mothers who often examine their flaws, checked in um, or check in with the mirror and complained about their appearance, were more likely to raise daughters with a heightened sense of insecurity who did the same. And it just goes to show, like, how you speak to yourself, how you act about yourself, how you speak to your about yourself to other people. When you think people aren't watching, your kids are watching and they're learning from that. Some about what you just said just really hit home the fact that I need to work on my self-image, right? Because, like, that affects how I carry myself. That affects how I respond to situations, how... I welcome other people or how I greet other people. Um, Self-image is super important because your kids will glean that from you. Like the people who are around you the most every day are yourself, your spouse probably, and then your kids, right? Well, and I think it even goes further. It's, It's teaching your child that, again, love and worth does not come from how they look or you know, how they should be treated. So how we treat each other and what comments we make to each other, we're teaching our kids that's how their spouse should talk to them and should act to them. And it's just, it's wild. And this is where it gets so terrifying as a parent because it's like every single thing you're saying, doing is influencing your your kids. I mentioned I, I dislike the word good because how do you gauge that? I also dislike the word happy. So I am <laughs> thinking about this topic as like how can you how can you be content in any in all situations, right? And bridging back to the last but one. It's, content it's not, isn't on the upper side of the spectrum of positive. It's like the middle line. I think that's up for debate. I think content could just be like you're at peace. It doesn't, it's not like you're riding the highest high. You're not in the deepest lows. You're like content. That's a, it's a beautiful place to be. It's like accepting things and bridging back to the perfection conversation. Like so many people feel like you need to have the perfect job with the perfect salary and yada yada. It's like, it's not about that. It's about, Hey, you know, I didn't get into this, the college that I wanted to that's okay. I can be content. I gave it my all. I think I view, I think I view the definition in, in a, a slightly different light, but it's semantics. Yeah. It's just how, it's how we're defining it. Um, also this is so freaking important. We want to show our kids that, uh, life is not all about us. We want to do that through our actions. We want to do that through how we share things. We want to do that through how we open our home up community is the like most joyful part of life I feel like and when I'm stuck in a at a fork in the road I try to push myself towards the decision that will bring me into closer community with someone else and that goes for a lot of things whether it's a job whether it's 
a house we're looking at or whatever. How do you feel about that? I I think teaching kids that you should be living life for other people. I mean. Serving. Yeah. We, Tithing. we aren't living life to just consume, make, and acquire as much as possible. We're, we're living life to impact people, to help them, and to help ourselves as well. So serving with your time, giving with your money, sharing with whatever material goods you do have, that's a super important value set to give your kids. And I feel like so many people in society um, skew serving as like a punishment when it should truly be a privilege to be in community with other people, to help people get out of dark and low places. I mean, that is, that is a true privilege. If you can impact someone's life, you're changing their life forever. And that's a gift unlike anything that could be monetary. Can I just riff on my rough trajectory of how life goes for a lot of people? Sure. I'm a big biography guy. I love reading. I love history. I've recently read Cornelius Vanderbilt's biography, John D. Rockefeller's, Andrew Carnegie, uh, even like Warren Buffett, some of these newer contemporary people and figures. And the arc always ends with giving back. So it's like a lot of people when they're young before college are just trying to figure out, Hey, am I good at something? And then they figure out, Hey, I'm good at something. And then they do it and they hit it hard, like in their twenties and you're like pursuing this career and you realize like how fun it is to accumulate and build your bank account and build the new house of your dreams and build your family. And then you realize like, Oh, there's only so much satisfaction that can come from that. So the latter half of, of all of these successful people's lives is always now helping someone else achieve that point. And like, there's a book called good to great where the best leaders are always able to equip the next generation to continue the race and, and to like carry the baton. So anyway, just a mind shift change from making it all about yourself. It's so limited if like in comparison to, sharing things, sharing your knowledge, sharing your goods, whatever. That's my hot take on it. <laughs> I do think one of the most important things to remember is community, who you're centering, like who you're putting your kids around. Um, it's going back to all of these points of unconditional love and serving others, how you treat yourself, being happy and confident, all of those. Those apply to everybody your kid is around. So are people making them earn their love? Are they treating themselves poorly? Like all of it. You have to be very selective and very smart in how you and who you surround your kids with. Yeah. We're also, I mean, we sent Drew to school when she was young. We try to get them socialized as often as possible because I feel like when you're around other people, your rough edges get softened and your your uh i think flaws get exposed and so like how can we use the power of community as a tool to shape us and how we parent but also shape our kids and how they're being raised so like being super intentional especially as they're in these formation formative years of like putting them around people who are going to help going to help form them positively mm -hmm. and by positively i mean closer to the vision that we have for them at the end of the day what's, Shana, what's the vision <laughs> you have for them i i view drew as like this uh incredibly ambitious talented leader who um is a go-getter who is a builder who um how do you feel about what i'm saying right now <laughs> let me let me let me rephrase because in my mind that's who i view drew becoming okay which is not necessary 
the more important thing is her becoming loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, generous, faithful, with self-control. How do you feel about that? I think raising a good human is teaching them those qualities. Correct. I think putting the pressure and expectation on them to be talented, a leader, a builder, mm. that is teaching your kid to earn what you want for them. I will accept that. I agree. That was the that was the path I was just going down with that. And I think as a mom, my goal in life is to teach my kids what you just said, patient, kind, everything, but to teach them that they're capable of whatever they want. Hmm. And knowing that I will be there for them and I will love them every step of the way. But instilling in them that confidence to know that whatever life throws at them, they can handle it is a good human to me. I love that. I love that. I'm thinking about the identity statement I wrote down for like who the Bible says that we are, which is powerful. So it's like, Everything I just said, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. To have them acknowledge that they are talented at something that they were, that, is that, am I still crossing the line? That they have qualities that can contribute. How about that? Whatever contribute that means. To what? Com their community. Yeah. I, I just think. I don't disagree. I just think society has tarnished that word, talented, to be... Contribute? I even think society has skewed that. Okay. Because I think society would say, if you are contributing to society, you are being, you are, you are successful. You are... All contributions to society are either people who make names for themselves or are high up in the societal, like world i said contribute to the community so that could be their family that could be their friend group their school however large you want to make that circle like i would say <laughs> as a parent for me those are words that i wouldn't use i i feel you but just so you know contribute i'm saying like hey you contributed because you made everybody smile today or you contributed because you served I have to go on one more tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so Don't you think that skews their mind to think you contributed because you got them to smile in a, in a essence and in a way is still teaching them to earn people's to earn their validation and worth in society. Because they have to contribute in order to get a good job from you, you know. I'm not I'm even saying, saying like, that they need to contribute as much as that they acknowledge that they can. Okay, yes, but then you would have to go back and change your statement cuz you said my dream for them is to be a good contributor to community. You know? It's just like it's semantics. Here's what I'll do. This is this is a challenge, this is a homework assignment for for you listening. And definitely for Sean and I, define what does it mean to be a good human, mm -hmm. right? Define, uh, if you have kids, what do you actually hope for them? And to help you, I will, I will link the doc that I have written out of like the qualities. It's not, it's not the things you'd have to do, but the qualities that I hope our kids have. How about that? Just to give you a little starting place. Uh, this was super interesting. Did yes. not expect. I, I was actually not excited about this episode. I was. You were. <laughs> well, I just like raising a good human. Like, first of all, we don't know what the frick we're doing. No, but you know, what I'm this saying? consumes every ounce of every day of my life. Yes. Every single word that comes out of my mouth, action. I now think about how it's impacting my children like every day you ask why I beat myself up on a daily basis of like what could I have done to better why 
just all these things. It's because I don't want to screw up my job. It's the best job in the world. That was an interesting one. Thank you for listening. If you made it this far, please subscribe to the show and give it a rating. Sean, I love you. You do a great job with our children. And you have helped raise me personally as your husband. I'm not kidding. I was talking to my dudes the other day about this. Who the heck would I be if I did not have my wife? I'd be curious what you said. (laughs) I love you too, Thank you for listening. That's all we have. I'm Andrew. I'm Andrew. I'm Sean. (laughs) We're the East fam. (laughs) Out.